to see you again. Hope you're feeling well. Uh, take your seat, please, and we continue with our conference. Before we start our session, I would like to inform you that we have distributed the compromise text of the conclusions. I hope that we can later on agree on that. Let's proceed. Today we are focusing on the topic of European security and defense. For this session, I have invited uh, my dear colleague, Ms. Inara Muljetze, speaker of the Seim of the Republic of Latvia, Wolfgang Schäuble, President of German Bundestag, and Wolfgang Sobotka, President of the Austrian National Council, to share their views on the topics. Colleagues, before I give the floor the to the first panelist, I'm opening the list for debate, so you can already request the floor by pressing the button on your conference unit. But now it's my pleasure to invite Ms. Inara Murnietze. She has been a speaker of SEMA since November 2014 and member of SEMA since 2011. She was a chairperson of the Human Rights and Public Affairs Committee at first. Please, Inara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eki. And dear Eki, dear colleagues, I want to thank the Estonian Parliament for excellent organization of the EU Speakers Conference. The conference is uh, very successful. Well, it's a privilege for me to speak about the EU security and defense. And Tallinn is a perfect place to discuss this topical issue. Under the Estonian EU presidency, we made significant progress in creating European defense architecture. It's undeniable that we need is a new level of ambition in security and defense. The crisis at Europe's borders forced us to act to protect our open societies. Our citizens see the harm done by terrorism and the migration crisis the various kinds of damage created by Russia, its hybrid and information warfare. Today, our citizens define security as the main priority in the EU. Now we have found a way forward. Latvia welcomes the deepening of the EU defense cooperation and launching of the permanent structured cooperation PESCO. It was made possible thanks to the German-French leadership and the determination, unity, and courage of the member states. Let us be clear. In the modern battlefield, no country can act alone. We need allies. And there is no question that to keep Europe safe, we need NATO. After the events in Georgia and later Ukraine, this, this has become crystal clear. After Ukraine, Latvia recognized that it was wrong to assume that military aggression could never return to Europe. Today, Latvia, as well as the other Baltic countries, spend at least 2% of GDP on defense. And dear colleagues, we regret the time we did not. We all should invest adequately. Today, we increasingly look not only to NATO, but also to the EU for defense cooperation. NATO and the EU each have their strengths and specific roles to play. The EU can best help in the fields where civilian and military efforts converge. The EU defense initiatives can strengthen NATO by increasing collective capabilities. Also, better developed EU defense will also deepen the EU-NATO cooperation. PESCO is a major step forward. What is needed now, after the enthusiastic beginning, is practical results. We want to make use of the PESCO joint projects. <laughs> Our project should be meaningful and visible to gain public support. Within PESCO, we see a particular value in military mobility projects. The EU can help simplify the cross-border procedures to enhance the speed of movement of military forces across Europe. Of course, 
this is not an easy task, <coughs> as many stakeholders are involved, ranging from the EU institutions to local authorities. But we really hope to see the first practical results soon. We also see the benefits of closer EU cooperation in defense industry. The European defense sector needs to overcome overlapping and fragmentation. The European Defense Fund would help to improve the competitiveness of the vast European defense industry. Here, we should not overlook small and medium enterprises. PESCO can use the strengths of each member state, especially the niche capabilities of smaller states. For instance, the Baltic states are leading in information technology, digitization, and research on cybersecurity. Speaking about cyber defense and hybrid threats, I'm glad that the EU and NATO practical cooperation is progressing. The Helsinki Center of Countering Hybrid Threats is another great example. We should continue strengthening the EU-NATO cyber security cooperation to adapt in today's digital age, the world that is rap rapidly evolving. Following the Salisbury attack, we have agreed to bolster capabilities to address hybrid threats, including in the cyber and strategic communication. These issues must be dealt with as a matter of urgency. <coughs> One more thing. We must not forget that the defense begins with the minds of people. We need to strengthen our minds to be able to protect our democratic values. The Kremlin, in its information war, employs a wide range of weapons, including TV stations and internet trolls. People sometimes do not know whom to believe. To face this, knowledge and critical thinking are the best medicine. To succeed, the only way is being strategic in our political communication. I'm proud of our NATO Stratcom Center in Latvia, which contributes to these efforts. The EU Stratcom Task Force should be strengthened. More needs to be done in strategic communication in telling our own story. Today, we have a good story to tell. PESCO is a major chapter in the EU narrative. PESCO is not only a framework, it's a process of the EU acting together, continue, continuing with the European integration, communicating to citizens the idea of united and strong Europe. It means meeting the citizens face to face. We, the national parliaments, have a special role in communicating the EU policies to our people. Right now, there is strong support among European citizens for EU defense cooperation. What we need is further practical work to rebuild our defenses. And it is about sharing responsibilities and common political will. It is also about the strengths of the transatlantic bond and our ability to invest more in our capabilities. And again, it's about Communic communicating to our citizens. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Inara. Our next speaker will be Dr. Wolfgang Schäubel. His parliamentary career started already in 1972. Younger people, can you imagine? He has been a Federal Minister of the Interior and the Federal Minister of Finance, and in October last year he was elected uh, as a President of the German Bundestag. Please, Dr. Schäuble, the floor is yours. Thank you, President. Thank you very much. Mr. President, colleagues, the goal of collective security has been anchored in the European treaties since Maastricht a quarter of a century ago. Since then, the world has changed dramatically. It has not become safer. New additional threats and dangers have developed, threats that most people could not have imagined back then. Asymmetric warfare, 
hybrid threats, cyber attacks, Islamist terrorism, disintegrating states in the Middle East and in North Africa, and the largest number of refugees since 1945. And not least, the violation of the European Peaceful Order, the Charter of Paris, through deliberate destabilization and illegal annexation. Added to this are partners who appear increasingly remote from us. Some of them call into question the Transatlantic Defense Alliance. Others appear to be distancing themselves even further from our values, from our ideas of democracy, the rule of law and freedom. We all are united in the realization that, in view of the complex nature of the threats faced in this globalized world, the only chance we have is to pursue a common foreign foreign and security policy, we as Europeans, in the realization that irrespective of the strength of future U.S. engagement, we Europeans must take on greater responsibility for our own security. We must become more weltpolitikfähig, as Commission President Juncker put it, better able to hold our own on the global stage. The ambitions described in speeches and papers are considerable, as are the expectations of our citizens. When they are asked about the most urgent problems which should be tackled by the EU, three quarters of Europeans cite security and protection as top priorities. And despite these expectations, the shared community institutions are relatively powerless. The member states alone are the decisive players in foreign security and defense policy. And the readiness to share national sovereignty is not particularly great. If we think back to the early years of the European integration process, this was probably always the case on defense issues. The European Defense Community project failed due to the unwillingness to make concessions on national sovereignty. This was an early lesson, not least on the power of parliaments, by the way. My personal belief is that we need a European army, and the sooner the better. Unfortunately, however, a large gap still exists between the necessary and the feasible in European security and defense policy. Yet it is better to move forward step by step than not at all. And the steps taken by the EU since the Brexit decision in the UK are significant. Especially PESCO, the permanent structured cooperation agreed by 25 member states last December, finally. The European Defence Fund, which has the potential to create synergy effects. For it seems obvious that 20 different types of combat aircraft and 17 types of main battle tank make neither military nor economic sense. Then, enhanced closer cooperation with NATO and the attempt to finally remove the obstacles to the EU battle groups, which have existed since 2005, but they have never been deployed. And there have been other achievements, too. This is all positive and right, and there is broad agreement on it in principle. But what are the resulting challenges for us? for the parliamentarians. PESCO could be the first stage in building a European Defence Union, whatever form this ultimately takes. The participating states have committed themselves to developing their defence capacities and making them available. This represents a political rather than a legal commitment. National sovereignty is not affected. This avoids the problems with ratification procedures which would otherwise, otherwise arise. There is a flip side to this, however, as with all intergovernmental agreements. The translation of declarations of intent into reality is wholly dependent on the member states' political will and readiness to honor their commitments. And the defense policy, more than in other areas, this means that it is dependent on governments. That makes our task of parliamentary involvement and oversight even more important. The governments are accountable to the national parliaments. 
In its resolution of December 2016, the European Parliament therefore rightly stressed the need for a strengthened role of national parliaments in implementing the common foreign and security policy. The German Bundestag is currently seeking enhanced rights to information in this field. The desirable ever closer cooperation amongst the Europeans and with the other NATO partners increases complexity and reduces transparency. This makes parliamentary oversight of security and defense policy more difficult. The question is how we can nevertheless ensure sufficient involvement of parliaments, which is vital, not least for the sake of public acceptance, because European defense policy is often viewed skeptically, at least that is the case in Germany. The most recent developments are also the subject of intense debates in the German Bundestag. One of the answers is to intensify cooperation between our parliaments. Thus, parliamentary involvement in PESCO will be the subject of an agreement between the Bundestag and the Assemblée Nationale, currently being negotiated by the two sides. The interparliamentary conference will also take on increasing importance the further we move towards a common foreign and security policy. Yet, cooperation will not suffice. If we are serious about common European defense, we will also have to change laws. For instance, for armaments cooperation, where in the not-too-distant future, we will have to talk about the national export regimes and align legal provisions or requirements of parliamentary approval for military missions. In Germany, every military deployment abroad requires Parliament's agreement. This provision has been copied, though in varying forms, in other European states. Some of you do not apply it at all to deployments in the EU or NATO framework. This would not be possible in Germany, since, against the background of our history, the rulings of our constitutional court are strict on this issue. Nevertheless, we will have to tackle the question of whether and how the German requirement for parliamentary approval should be adapted. In short, we will all have to do our homework. We will have to equip ourselves for closer, more effective cooperation and for countering new kinds of threats. Some of us will need to get up to speed and begin by enhancing their classic defense capabilities. Yet the most important thing is for us to clarify what kinds of missions we want to collectively use our armed forces for. European defense must be embedded in a foreign and security policy concept, encompassing diplomacy, civilian crisis management, and police and judicial cooperation, but also development, trade, and immigration policy. And perhaps that is the most difficult thing of all, defining common interests, priorities, and strategies. Speaker Nestor, your country is celebrating an important anniversary this year. Hundred years ago, Estonia became an independent republic, though it was only truly independent for around half of this time, as a result of the criminal Hitler-Stalin pact and of Soviet expansionism. Awareness of this history is key to, the, to understanding the particular concerns in the Baltic states in relation to the Russian policy of destabilization in Ukraine. Each of our countries has a unique history, and our history shapes our national identity, along with the direction and focus of our outlook on the world. These different histories cannot be blended into one. Anybody who wants Europe must accept this diversity and get to know and respect particular national characteristics. And anybody who wants progress on European integration must be ready to make compromises and must not see their own ideas as the be-all and end-all. Only this way can we create more common ground. Only in this way can the EU prove that it is able to protect its citizens and to secure freedom and democracy in an increasingly globalized and digitalized world. We must learn to think together, as a German journalist recently said. He was thinking of Franco-German relations, yet I believe this holds true for all those who really want European defense. We need to learn to think together, and a forum like today's can hopefully help achieve this. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Schäuble. And our final keynote speaker is Mr. Wolfgang Sobotka. He was elected president of the National Council of Austria in December last year. Before becoming the speaker, he served as a federal minister of interior and the deputy governor of Lower Austria and member of the Lower Austria's regional government. Please, Mr. Sobotka, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, distinguished colleagues. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation to this conference. Estland, Estonia has um, a very successful presidency, and this is certainly a very perfect um, ending point of this presidency for Estonia. Thank you very much. In the second half of 2007, uh, Austria will take over the EU Council presidency from Bulgaria in the context of the current EU Troika presidency. We are in close contact with Estonia and with Bulgaria. Today's meeting underlines once again that we want to make contribution to a strong common Europe, not only at government level, but also at parliamentary level. Ladies and gentlemen, we want a visible Europe, a Europe oriented to solutions, subsidiarity, and respecting the sovereignty of its member states. Sovereignty of Europe and the member states must be complementary and not in a competition. So a strong Europe at the same time is um, a sign of European diversity. European security and defense is one of the major issues for which we need more Europe today. The challenges in the security arena have changed. Dr. Schäuble just said it in a very clear way. In addition to the conflicts in our neighborhood, terrorism, cyber attacks, and uncontrolled migration have emerged as new threats since 2017, uncontrolled migration. The European Union has to assume even more responsibility to counter these threats, more responsibility for its own security. To do more, today more than ever, Europe must speak with one, one voice in matters of security and defense policy, and the member states must provide a common response to current threats and keep Europe able to act. Against this backdrop, we must see security in a comprehensive way. The European Union has to act against internal threats, internal security, cybercrime, terrorism, religious radicalism. For too long, in the cooperation between police and security authorities, we did not find the right level. Only in January 2015, we started to intensify this cooperation on the European level. Let me say very clearly, we cannot afford not to uh, discuss also about European Islam. Is Islam. Be it only to um, protect well-integrated Muslims in Europe. Then we need also the means in Europe to protect our borders and, and external borders. Certainly, the EU must be able to ensure security and stability in its neighborhood. Security is an essential factor in strengthening, strengthening the citizens' confidence in the European Union. In order to cater to this aspect, the Austrian presidency of the Council of the EU will be placed under the motto, a Europe that protects. Let me touch briefly on the three dimensions of European security I mentioned earlier. The fight against terrorism has shown how European solidarity in security matters can work in practice. Following the terrorist attack of November 13, 2015, France invoked the mutual assistance clause enshrined in the treaties. It was on this basis that the EU member states provided assistance to support an EU partner. In order to protect Europe lastingly from the threat of terrorism, we need more than that. We need measures to combat the financing of terrorist activities and steps to curb terror propaganda through de-radicalization. There's also a need for action of, at national level. Only last week, after 
intensive discussions, the Austrian Parliament adopted a comprehensive security package. An essential point in this package relates to the monitoring of encrypted messages or messenger services uh, with the authorization of a judge. The EU's global strategy of 2016 places particular emphasis on cyber security in the EU's foreign and security policy. And rightly so. The internet and modern communication technologies have undeniably brought benefits for our society. At the same time, we are seeing that criminal entities are increasingly misusing ICT tools for criminal activities. Eleven years ago, Estonia was confronted with a series of cyber attacks directed against state bodies, including the Estonian Parliament. Estonia is today an ideal country concerning IT security, and we would like to use these technical um, capabilities in the future as well. There were also attacks against the German Bundestag and the Austrian Parliament, and we have to protect ourselves. In addition to classic hacker attacks and DDoS attacks, there is another threat which we must combat, the exertion of influence on public opinion in EU member states through targeted information and disinformation campaigns. This is an issue that touches upon the very core of our parliamentary democracy. We must make sure that it is impossible to manipulate the electoral behavior of European citizens from outside. A Europe that protects needs to take precautions and actions also in this aspect. As far as I am concerned, cybersecurity also includes dealing with hate postings in social media. Deleting such posts ex post is usually too late. We should therefore consider introducing a mandatory principle in traditional as it exists in traditional media. They have the same principles as television, radio. But there should be this editorial principle as it exists for traditional media to prevent the spreading of discriminatory slogans on the internet. A Europe that protects must ensure a seamless control of its external borders. This is a task that cannot be solved at national level alone. Member states must cooperate better and more closely in this domain. The protection of the EU's external borders is one of the cornerstones for curbing illegal migration to Europe. This migration is not over, as we could see also after the analysis of the European, of the President of the European Parliament. Three steps are necessary in this context. Frontex needs a new and stronger mandate. States with EU external borders need increased support and cooperation with countries of transit and origin needs to be enhanced. Resettlement and solidarity are linked and separately. If citizens have confidence in the European Union, it will depend also on this issue of migration. Colleagues, a Europe that protects must spare no efforts to ensure peace and security in its neighborhood. This, this includes the will to strengthen cooperation in civil and military crisis management. The establishment of permanent structured cooperation last year, PESCO, or my predecessor has already mentioned it, was last year an important basis for this aspect at EU level. We take part in this cooperation, we Austrians, provided it does not affect the specific nature of our security and defense policy. The Western Balkan states have a clear European perspective. Due to its geographical proximity and historical ties, Austria feels a strong responsibility for supporting the stability of the Western Balkans. We will therefore be happy to take up if we think of the 90s, that more security is not so long uh, ago, this region especially was threatened or was concerned with um, armed conflicts. This is why we will be happy to take up and continue the Bulgarian presidency's focus on this area. The states of the Western Balkan have a clear European perspective, and they are a, a partner with the European Union. 
Our common cultural and historical background is an important aspect in this context as well. We observe an increasing influence of outside players in the Western Balkans, and this has to be our response. We need to do more to help these countries to get closer to the European Union. For the countries of the Western Balkans, the EU accession perspective needs to remain something that is achievable, concrete and tangible. At the same time, new momentum is needed for reforms, particular and respect of the rule of law. It is our aim to make measurable progress in bringing the region closer to the European Union during our presidency. The EU would send out a strong and positive signal if it were to start accession negotiations with Albania and Macedonia as early as 2018. I think we also need to do more at parliamentary level to forge closer ties with the Western Balkans. Parliaments are places where government and opposition achieve a democratic compromise. The precondition for a functioning parliamentary system is the participation of all elected representatives in the decision-making process. In concrete terms, this means intensifying exchanges with parliaments in the Western Balkans, both at the level of parliamentary speakers and within bilateral parliamentary groups. In cooperation with partner parliaments, we are planning to implement the democracy workshops, a showpiece project among the Austrian Parliament's political education actors. We want with these initiatives strengthen parliamentarism and thus democracy in the region. I would like to extend my very best wishes for the remaining months of your presidency to my colleagues from Bulgaria. Thank you once again. And my congratulations for the presidency here in Tallinn. Estonia is not a very friendly and hospitable country, but also an Excellent organizer. Thank you very much again, and my congratulations. I look forward to welcoming you all in Vienna next year on April 8 and 9 in Vienna next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, dear colleague. Dear speakers, uh, thank you all for your interesting thoughts, and we have now heard all the keynote speeches, and I can see that many of you have signed up for the debate, and the registration remains open. I would like to remind you that when I give the floor, please do not press any buttons. The microphone will switch automatically. And today, I'm much more liberal than yesterday. You can have four minutes for your speeches. Um, so our main goal is that everybody who wishes to take the floor can do so. And uh, somewhere at 11 o'clock, we will have a short break. But now we start with the interventions. And uh, our dear colleague from Netherlands, Anki Brukers Knul. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. In the 21st century, we see new elements of warfare that change the way the game is played. Cyber warfare, disinformation, terrorism, and economic warfare are becoming almost as threatening as the traditional warfare. The combination of all these elements, so-called hybrid warfare, places us for new challenges in an area that is characterized by a ring of instability around our European borders. These elements increasingly have an undermining effect on our democratic societies, which is a very worrying situation. It is a good sign that just now the European cooperation on the field of security and defense has at last grown to serious proportions. With PESCO, with the Global Str Strategy, and with the European Defence Action Plan, major steps have been taken in the last two years. I would like to underline that increased cooperation on the field of security and defence is not a matter of idealistic dreams of an ever closer union. This increased cooperation is and should be purely a matter of self-interest, a matter of efficiency, a matter of l'union fait la force, unity makes strength. It speaks for itself that all initiatives within the EU, within NATO, and outside these organizations should be complementary to each other 
and should be developed in good cooperation within the existing frameworks. It also speaks for itself that cooperation on these fields should only be increased with the support and trust of our citizens. Defense, security and foreign affairs are historically the core business of sovereign states and therefore the most difficult to share with other countries. Therefore, parliamentary control is essential. With regard to the security of the European Union, I would like to underline the importance of EU commitment to the countries in the Western Balkans. Stability in this region that has been instable for so many years is of crucial importance for the European Union. It is of crucial importance for Europe. We cannot afford a new crisis at the European borders. The Western Balkans represent a geopolitically important part of our continent. Many competitors behind the scenes are struggling for influence in the region. Russia is willing to restore its footprint and has become more and more active in the last decade. China is set to become the number one foreign investor in Serbia this year. Radical Islamic groups are spreading their hateful ideologies in the mosques of Sarajevo, Pristina and Tirana, having convinced more than 1,000 fighters from the Western Balkans to join the ranks of ISIS in the Middle East. All these foreign powers are more than ready to step into whatever vacuum the European Union leaves behind. In that regard, we welcome the six flagship initiatives that were presented in February this year to for enhanced EU engagement in the Western Balkans. Combined with recent statements of the European Commission about the start of accession negotiations with Albania and Macedonia in reaction to the progress reports of the candidate member states, I can conclude that the Western Balkans are on the agenda. Paramount is that these countries, for their own interest and the benefit of their citizens, want uh, to adhere to the European values of freedom, democracy, and human dignity. And as on the, the subject of migration, the refugee crisis of the last two years made two things clear. First, for too long we failed to recognize the urgency of the problems, and second, we, uh, we were warned, but we were not ready. And we now know that the issue of migration is a challenge that none of the European member states can manage on their own. So I would encourage the European Commission to translate the conclusions of the EU-Africa Summit of November last year into concrete actions. We need an ambitious agenda out of our own interest to be prepared for the challenges to come. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Anki. And our uh, next intervention is going from Iceland. Steingrimur Sigvusson, the floor is yours, my dear colleague. Thank you. Um, I would first of all like to congratulate you, Honorable Chair, uh, Speaker Ekinestor of the Riki Kuku, for your excellent leadership of this gathering, and also thank you for the generous hospitality that we have enjoyed here in, in Tallinn, Estonia, as your guests. On behalf of the specially invited guests, the speakers of the parliaments of the EFTA countries, Iceland, Norway, and Switzerland, uh, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. We had our own little side meeting uh, yesterday and all agreed that it's very valuable for us to be able to come and engage in this parliamentary uh, de debates on uh, highly important topics as, as uh, the future of European cooperation and security. Uh, although we have, some of us, chosen a different path for our European cooperation, than join the EU. We are all the same European nations. We want to contribute uh, to peace, prosperity, and, and stability. And uh, we share common values, and we are all in the same boat when it comes to the importance of securing stability and peace. Uh, so we welcome specifically the chance to engage in discussion on European security in the broadest sense of the concept. Um, also regarding your work on, on the future cooperation from the sideline, we that have are not, not members wish you all the best and all the success, including a successful Brexit, if that is to be. Uh, we are uh, involved from both sides, being connected to the 
common market, uh, either through the e European Economic Area Agreement or bilateral agreements, uh, as in the case of Switzerland, but we also have UK as a very important trading partner. Uh, so we hope for a successful solution of this and think it's very important for Europe uh, uh, to come in the future, yes, that this all peace becomes uh, peaceful, soft and successful. Now to show a very good example, make your life easier, Mr. Chair, uh, I will uh, share the rest of my four minutes with other speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, dear friends, before I give the floor to our Italian colleague, uh, I must say to you that the interpretation from Italian will follow with some delay, so please be patient, uh, but I'm sure that Maria Edera Spadoni would like to use his own beautiful language. Maria Edera Spadoni, the floor is yours. Thank you, President. Yes, I confirm I'd like to use my beautiful language. So I will talk in Italian and I will try to talk slowly so there won't be any problem of interpretation. President Nestor, cari colleghi. Mr. Nestor, dear colleagues, I believe that our consideration on the issue at hand here should start from three main issues. How to pursue in view of the global threats, security within our societies. How it should be understood, how it should be understood following the principles and core European values, and what priority actions should the, should the European Union develop in this phase. Regarding the first issue, I am firmly convinced that although I believe terrorism must indeed be fought against, together with organized crime, however, we must put our accent, we must emphasize prevention and social uh, policies. I refer in particular to the, to the integration processes, inclusion processes and resettlement and de-radicalization de of people who are considered at risk and, are, and even of foreign fighters who are returning to, the, to their home countries. And the European Union has already recommended these actions and the, uh, and the Union is supporting these actions indeed. But I also consider, consider it necessary to invest financially and politically more for measures to promote to reduce factors of risk, like inequalities, mar uh, marginalization, sense of exclusion, racism, incitement to hatred and violence, that fuel many of the criminal behaviors within our own countries. Only in this way will it be possible to consolidate the cohesion and a sense of belonging to one community, which is the first shield for the security of our own societies. And now I'll come to the issue of reconciliation of how on uh, the issue of how to reconcile security with our common principles. I am I, I firmly believe that the Union should keep pursuing fundamental rights and freedoms because the protection of fundamental rights of and freedoms make our continent a unique example at world level. We cannot become prisoners of our own fear. Any limit, any waiver of uh, present rights can only be temporary, proportional, and limited to any situations of imminent threats or danger. And this applies to the proposals, which is now under consideration, to extend the suspension of the, sh the, suspension of the, Schengen, uh, of the Schengen space and the reestablishment of internal border controls. The free circulation of people is a key pillar of the uh, is a key non-economic pillar of the integration process, and that should be uh, supported. Otherwise, we run the risk of disgregation for the European Union. I think the priority in the fight against terrorism, and this is the third issue that I'm introducing here, uh, would be a better coordination at European level among the intelligence communities in order to overcome the shortcomings that we have seen in many new in many different cases. And also, we need to uh, urgently approve the proposals to combat the possibilities for self-funding for criminal, for criminal organizations. And we should be able to control and to pass instruments against, uh, against money laundering and to impose civil for future. Thank you. Thank you. 
And um, our next speaker on the list is Georges Lacau from Portugal. The floor is yours. Dear speaker, dear colleagues, Europe today is facing several global security challenges. The traditional roles of Russia and the United States are no longer predicable. The turmoil of the Islamic world has consequences for our countries. Furthermore, new threats like uncontrolled migration, terrorism, cyber attacks and hybrid ones cannot be ignored. Thus, more than ever, a common response for common problems is needed. Speaking of European security means, on the one hand, addressing the fundamental role of Europol as a guarantee for effective cooperation between law enforcement agencies. On the other hand, speaking of European security and defense also means the recognition of the execution of the global strategy regarding common security and defense policy, and in particular, the permanent structured cooperation. In fact, the step taken by 25 member states to join the permanent structured cooperation in the area of defense is decisive for to develop of a truly European defense autonomy, based on a common strategic view and capabilities, always taking in account the principle of complementary to NATO. In this context, parliaments must play a major role and they shall not only provide the necessary budget means, but also scrutinize the execution of the security and defense projects. In Portuguese Parliament, we have changed our law on monitoring assessment and pronouncement by the Assembly within the scope of the process of constructing the European Union in order to add new competences to the Parliament regarding the scrutiny of the PESCO dossier. Joint meetings with the European Affairs Committee and the Member of Government during the week prior to the Council of Foreign Affairs, whenever questions related to PESCO are foreseen. One annual debate in plenary in the first trimester of each year with the participation of the government about participation in PESCO. The annual report about Portugal participations in the European Union shall have a separate chapter about the participation in PESCO. In fact, we should also keep in mind that defense will be one of the new priorities to include in multi-annual financial framework after 2020. And it will be necessary to find the right and balance between the so-called traditional areas there as agriculture and cohesion funds and the creation of new funds allocated to, to projects that will support the development and the integration of European defense industries. Finally, the development of European defense and security shall not be down weakening other dimensions, there is cohesion policy or the deepening of the European Economic and Monetary Union. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now our dear colleague from Turkey, Ayşenur Pakçıkapılı. The floor is yours. Teşekkür ederim Sayın Başkan, Sayın Meslektaşlarım. Mr. Speaker, dear colleagues, I would like to extend my deepest respect to each and every one of you on behalf of the Turkish Grand National Assembly. As Turkey, we closely follow up the contributions of Europe to security and defense. And we uh, attach great importance to the fact that the efforts of EU in terms of security and defense should be complementary of NATO. And the security and defense of Turkey is directly linked with Europe. Uh, it is why we have been uh, contributing and supporting the phenomena uh, that is the EU's common security and defense policy 
on the other hand, although some of the EU countries are trying to neglect this particular issue, but Turkey, because of its geostrategical position and because of its increasing and ever-improving defense capability, Turkey is an integral part of Europe's security. This is a reality. We have been fighting against all forms of terrorism, and thanks to this, and thanks to our role in to prevent uh, the illegal crossings of refugees to Europe, we have contributed a lot into Europe's security and defense. And, and we have played an important role and in terms of fighting against many challenges stemming up from state and non-state actors. And in the Turkey's role in terms of the Europe's security should definitely be re remembered. Um, the security of Europe starts with our country, and that is why we expect to be included both as a candidate country to Europe, to EU, and as a non-EU member state, but a NATO ally. So we would like to be contributed, contributed and uh, included to the efforts of EU. We would like to see EU's uh, efforts in terms of security and defense to be inclusive and transparent. And it is very important that um, the, there should be no new obstacles created for Turkey and other non-EU members in terms of the uh, recent efforts of EU in terms of security and defense. Uh, EU has made several official commitments to NATO, and we should not delay the realization of these commitments made by EU. And this NIS implementation and document is an important foundation in this respect. Turkey is a Balkan country at the same time, and the priority and objective in the region is stability, sustainable development, and peace, and strengthening all these. So to this end, uh, all countries in the region should be supported in terms of their membership to Europe's institutions and Euro-Atlantic institutions. Thank you very much to all. Thank you. And now from Croatia, Gordon Jandrokovic, Jandrokovic, sorry. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Dear colleagues, I will start my intervention on this topic with a recent statement by NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, who says, today we don't have the luxury of choosing the challenges we face. We have to be ready and capable for decisive operations in order to prevent and combat them. We all agree that we live in a time when the security situation in our environment becomes more complex and when new challenges arise from security ones, terrorism, cyber attacks, conflicts, uh, demographics changes, and increased migrations, to those such as climate changes and social inequalities as a result of globalization. Today, when these challenges gain a different dimension, they are setting up a new task in front of us, efficiency and innovation in the speed of identifying threats, speed of decision-making, and speed of action. And in order to respond quickly, we must constantly adjust and prove our relevance through continuous strengthening of cooperation within our security and defense policy and measures taken. In this respect, we welcome the establishment of permanent structure cooperation, PESCO. PESCO is indeed a historic step to strengthen European defense. Participation in PESCO should be seen as an opportunity to strengthen the operational capabilities and contribution of its own national armed forces, as well as promotion of its own defense industry through projects and its further development. This cooperation must be set up on the principles of inclusiveness, solidarity, and complementarity with NATO, without duplication of activities and with respect for member states' autonomy in decision-making. Another important issue for Croatia in strengthening internal security is the protection of the EU's external borders. In this sense, effective management of the EU's external borders is essential allowing people to continue to move freely within the European Union. One of the major European steps in this field 
is the creation of European border and coast guard system, which tackles security and migration challenges of today and helping to get back on the, to the normal functioning of the Schengen area. Finally, I would like to reiterate the importance of Southeast Europe for, Euro for European Union, in particular its security. Croatia is a proof that membership perspective is a peace-building project that significantly contributes to reconciliation and to building trust. We have to deliver on the promises we made to the candidates and potential candidates, just as these countries have to deliver on the requirements and implement the necessary reforms, and, all at, uh, and at all times we have to evaluate their individual achievements. Thank you for your attention, and Mr. Speaker, thank you for your warm hospitality. Thank you, Gordon. And ne the next speaker in our uh, list is Sir Lindsay Hoyle from United Kingdom. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I first of all start off by sending apologies from our speaker, who is busy in Parliament as we speak, getting ready. What I would say also to you is thank you for this conference and the way that it's been organized and the support that you've given for each visiting country from the EU. It's been second to none in your welcome and your hospitality. What I'd like to then go on to say is thank you to EU states. I thank you for the support that you gave to us in the aggression of Russia and the way that we stood shoulder to shoulder in saying to Russia, enough, enough is enough, and you must realize that we are not alone in the fight against your aggression. And that was a clear message we sent, and may that continue in the future. And of course, it is about the fight against whether it's terrorism, whether it's against cyber or physical. We need to be aware there are aggressive rogue states out there that want to bring down the democratic countries that we represent. And we've seen that. The attack that took place on Parliament from a Middle East country who had decided they didn't like what we stood for in the way that Russia continues to show its aggression. The fact that others will continue, whether it's North Korea, whatever. We know that cyber is a major problem for all of us. And that's why we must stand united in that defense. We can do that. We must continue to ensure that we are at the forefront in fighting cyber as well as, as, well as physical threats. We've seen terrorism. Terrorism came to the streets of London. Terrorism came to the Houses of Parliament. The fact we were robust in the fight against terrorism is something we must be strong. We've seen it in London, we've seen it in Paris, we've seen it in Spain. You name the countries. We've all been affected by terrorism, ISIS, radicalization. It is something that we must always stand against, something that we must be united. Of course, we are tolerant countries, but in the end, we cannot allow terrorism to come to the streets. So we must fight that together. We must share knowledge and information. That must be an ongoing fight that we must continue. And of course, we look, of course the European Union must stand together, but also we mustn't forget what NATO has brought us. It is not about what NATO has done in the past. It will also be what NATO will do in the future to ensure freedom and support and ensure democracy can exist. So NATO must also have a continuing role for all of us. And the other big issue, of course, is social media. We know that social media is a problem, whether it's attack on politicians, whether it's attack on a nation. We know that social media can encourage people to be radicalized. We know that it will encourage people to come and fight against democracy. And what I would say is, I think the time has come for all of us to think how we can legislate to ensure that social media has a conscience, and that it is there to help all. It's not about stopping freedom of speech, but it's about ensuring the rights and the democratic rights of the countries that we all represent. It is a freedom for all, not just for a few that we should stand for. So I do believe that the social media companies need to be aware. We won't tolerate what, what they've allowed to happen, whether it's racism, attacks on politicians, and usually the nastiest of all attacks 
are on women politicians. And social media allows those platforms to carry the threats of rape, murder against politicians. Well, the time has come for them to realise we won't tolerate it. And once again, Mr Speaker, I thank you for your hospitality. I thank you for those great relationships that we've had for the last 100 years. May it continue between the United Kingdom and Estonia as ever. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, and I'm sure that Europe is with you. Our next speaker on the list is Milan Brgles from Slovenia. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Dear colleagues, given that the future plans on a more effective common security defense have been broadly debated in this forum, please allow me to emphasize three aspects of this debate that I found very important and that we too often seem to forget about. First aspect, an effective common EU foreign policy, foreign and security policy can only be one that is focused, makes use of EU's key advantages, and is based on underlying EU values. In this respect, EU global strategy is an extremely important document. However, its implementation must not be based on an idealistic assumption that the EU can be everywhere and do everything. Good example is EU's diplomatic success in dealing with Iran nuclear crisis. Such determination should also be shown, for example, in the Middle East peace process, where EU so far promised a lot and delivered little. In addition, when the EU or its member states decide to take action in order to tackle external security threats, and such action involves the use of force, it must necessarily adhere to the strict rules of international law regulating it and known within the United Nations security system, collective security system. We must respect the rules we have committed to. After all, um, it, is, it has been always claimed that the rule of law is the key guarantor of peace and security. Second aspect. In, an, in a, an altered security environment, we must also rethink the notions of security itself and act accordingly. Developing the EU into a harder, not necessary hard power is to be welcomed due to Brexit and an altered foreign policy of our United States partners. Nevertheless, to put it simple, it is not all about guns. In order to provide a security environment for our citizens and the EU as a whole, we must first and foremost act in a preventive manner. For example, we quite, there is well-developed anti-terrorist cooperation between EU member states. But on the other side, programs of preventing radicalization remain sidelined and underfunded. But we should act proactively, not just to react. Finally, we need to rethink our perception of what security means. EU speaks also about human security. We must realize and translate into concrete policy that action aimed at development and human rights protection is also action aimed at improving our own security. And the third aspect, when addressing contemporary threats, we must preserve the delicate balance between security and liberty. Security and liberty based on the respect for fundamental rights are never mutually exclusive. This means that we cannot and must not have one at the expense of another. When we exclude one of them, we will be left without both. In this brave new world, scrutiny, scrutiny exercised by national parliaments plays an extremely important role. Parliaments, parliaments must reject security measures that unjustifiably invade the space of personal liberty and are disguised as ordinary pieces of legislation allowing even a few abuses as an acceptable side effect of improved security will change the tolerance level of the public and lead to a belief that fundamental rights are, ne are a negotiable luxury. Abuses of the system additionally lead to the systematic victimization of minority groups. And finally, parliaments should pay close attention to the developing practice of the European Court of Human Rights in respects of innovative security measures that remain ill-defined due to the absence of state and ju judiciary practice. Parliaments should push for and revise legislation accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Milan. 
And our next speaker is also from Slovenia, Alois Kosa, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dear colleagues, in the course of today's debate, I will, I will try to highlight also the two uh, issues of the importance. The decision of member states on the scenario for the future development of the European Union will also influence the multi-annual financial framework after the year 2020. It is important to take into account that significantly greater resources for the mutual defense will have to be allocated to the subsequent multi-annual financial framework, as we in the globalized world are facing a growing number of security and terrorist threats. But at the same time, we must find a way to preserve the level of resources intended for the cohesion policy, which has greatly contributed to the reduction of inequalities among the developed and underdeveloped regions in the European Union for many years. And the second issue. In 2015, when Slovenia had to face an exceptional pressure for illegal migrants traveling to the European Union through the so-called Balkan route, activities of the states of the Western Balkans strongly contributed to the stabilization of those conditions. Precisely because of this, we acknowledge today again the significance of the stability in this region for the whole European Union and beyond. From the ashes of the former Yugoslavia, new countries were created that have for numerous years made efforts to enter the European Union. I undoubtedly agree with the notion that these countries, just like all the other member states, must fulfill accession conditions. However, I believe that the European Union has done too little to encourage reforms in these countries. Both European institutions and the member states must engage more actively in aiding the mentioned countries so that at least some of them will have fulfilled all terms of accession, enacted all the required reforms, and join the European Union by 2025. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is from Poland, Stanislav Karszewski. The floor is yours. Thank you, dear speaker. The colleagues, the pillar of common defense is NATO, and its foundations are built on close transatlantic ties. The EU can and should be the structure which enhances the security of our common continent. The priority is defense of territory and transatlantic unity. That's why. So in the context of PESCO, we need to remember that it can be used to tackle some legal issues regarding military mobility and military Schengen. However, decisions regarding these capabilities should be taken inside the NATO military structures, not in the EU. The role of the European Defense Fund, part of the PESCO, should also be clearly defined. We believe that in order to preserve the cohesion of the EU, this new fund should not be used as a tool to structure or restructure military budgets of the member states. Moreover, member states need to coordinate efforts to thwart Russian propaganda attacks targeting our countries. The Kremlin knows how to stir up history of national antagonisms in our region. Putin will behave as a left-winger for left-wingers and as a conservative for conservatives and would show support for any extremisms or separatisms which are able to further divide the EU and play countries off against one another. In March 2014, the higher chamber of of Russian parliament held deliberations to give Putin the right to introduce troops to Ukraine. And one of the parliamentarians was asked about possible response of the West. And he said, well, quote, unquote, poshumyat, poshumyat, they will scream out, cry out, and then they will stop. We don't want that these words become the reality for the EU. If decision makers in Russia upheld the view that the West is able to behave only that way, the new aggressions will come. 
We should not promise our fellow citizens that the EU could have the status of a true military power, and we should not let ourselves misled by suggestions that European intervention forces can be built without adequate spending, hence without complying with the 2% GDP rule. Well, the, I believe that European democracy is mature enough to understand and recognize this truth. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our next speaker is Milan Stech from Czech Republic, please. Pane předsedo, dámy a pánové, ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, allow me to take this opportunity to express our thanks and gratitude for excellent preparation and organization of this conference. Well, when it comes to the Czech Republic, over the past two decades, we have succumbed to the illusion that the peace and security in Europe is actually something that we take for granted, something that should not be taken from us. The annexation of Crimea, the migration issues and terrorism has been a cruel awakening for all of us in the Czech Republic, both for the politicians as well as for the majority of the population of the Czech Republic. This is also documented by the fact that uh, when it comes to the political debates in our country, uh, there's no doubt that we need to increase our uh, military and defense spending within the framework of the agreed rules. That means 2% of the GDP. That's not a problem at all. Nevertheless, it does not mean that we are passive in the area of defense. The Czech Republic is active in missions in many countries around the world, especially countries which we consider to be a threat to peace and security in Europe. So basically, the Czech troops are participating in NATO missions, Afghanistan, Iraq. We've been to the Balkans. We are actually active in Bosnia and Kosovo. Golan Heights. Within the framework of UN, we are actually involved in Malian mission or in the mission in Mali. It is quite well known that uh, the Czech Air Force is actually conducting air policing both here in the Baltic states as well as uh, in Iceland. The Czech Republic, apart from the areas I have mentioned, is focusing on the cooperation of, of European Union and NATO. And I'd like to reiterate that we do not want to weaken the role of NATO, but I understand that this is a, an answer to the appeals uh, voiced by the, uh, by the United States of America, which have repeatedly invited Europe to take more responsibility for its own safety. So our priorities for the cooperation between EU and NATO are as follows. Deepening of cooperation and fight against the hybrid threats, including the cyber threats, coordinating exercises of NATO and EU, especially in the case of uh, hybrid warfare, cooperation on reinforcing the defense capabilities, fight against the migration issues by building uh, the security and defense capacities of our partners and help in the countries of origins of the migrants and facilitating the cross-border mobility of uh, military material and personnel, personnel uh, providing security to Europe, the need to remove the remaining obstacles in the area of uh, sharing classified information, and this is actually focused on the cooperation of intelligence services. Of course, the departure of the Great Britain from European Union shall not be to the detriment of of our own cooperation, especially in the area of defense policy. In view of the Czech Republic, it is important to make sure that the cooperation between organizations allows for efficient cooperation without duplicating activities, both on bilateral as well as on the global level. We hope that the PESCO will serve its purpose. We are happy that so many countries have subscribed for PESCO. It is important for us 
that this activity is open to the future countries such as Norway, Great Britain and the United States. And again, we must not duplicate NATO's activities. In my personal opinion, I also very much support to deal with the issue of social media, as indicated, because the social media is something, is a warfare that is actually oftentimes conducted by the people from our own countries, and it could be even more dangerous. Thank you for your attention, Excellency. Thank you, Milan. Dear colleagues, now it will be, before the next intervention, very important information for you. After Gérard Larcher, uh, there will be a coffee break. Monsieur Larcher, the floor is yours. Monsieur le Président, merci de cette importante information et merci surtout de votre accueil. Thank you very much. Les citoyens Thank attendent de l'Europe plus de sécurité. Les résultats électoraux récents Europeans want more security from the European Union, as we can clearly see from the recent uh, election results. European citizens want, want uh, Europe to protect them both inside and outside of Europe. So we are talking about the internal security and the external security. In order to efficiently fight uh, the Islamic uh, terrorism, as we have already heard from the pre previous speakers, we need to develop uh, efficient information exchange uh, systems um, and uh, uh, to strengthen Eurojust and also uh, our fight against radicalization. Our UK colleague also talked about this. We have heard about the social media issues and uh, I would like uh, to point out that we also need to think about the situation in prisons and we need to teach uh, the European values at schools. As for the immigration issue, we need to protect our external borders more efficiently. Uh, we have to strengthen Europol, we have to harmonize the asylum policy and also work together with the countries of origin and uh, transit. We need to have an ambitious uh, uh, development agenda for Africa. Africa. We also need to think that by the year 2050, Africa will have more than 2 billion people. So uh, when we think about security, we need to think of Africa and Africa's uh, development. We need to have a better coordination between our various policies, such as uh, military policy, development policy, uh, management uh, of the migration, fight against uh, human trafficking, we need to have a coordinated and a comprehensive approach. This is vital. Europe is also about external security. A few, weeks again, uh, a few weeks ago, I went to, uh, to see the forces who took uh, part in the Balkan missions. Uh, they, uh, they are on ground forces and they uh, help uh, in fighting against Boko Haram. I also uh, went uh, to the uh, to Chad and I visited the refugee camp. And uh, believe me, when I say security and development policy are two sides of one and the same coin. We have 30,000 French troops stationed outside France, and uh, these French troops need to believe in the support of the European partners. France is also very active in the uh, southern countries, in the southern regions, but we also are ready uh, to protect the eastern borders of um, the NATO countries. As you know, our uh, uh, jet fighters also take part in the uh, Baltic uh, mission. Uh, they help to protect the Baltic states. We will have uh, new uh, military operations uh, to protect the airspace in a few weeks, and the operation is already underway in Lithuania. We also have troops at sea. Uh, they keep an eye on the Russian and the Chinese uh, troops, uh, both on the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea, and also the Mediterranean Sea. As we have heard before, it's important to work uh, towards the goal of, uh, of a Defense Union, and uh, Europe must be a uh, reliable partner to NATO. We must uh, strengthen the European pillar, but we uh, need not duplicate, uh, duplicate what uh, NATO is already doing. Is it uh, 
vital for us to have 17 different types uh, of uh, military vehicles or uh, armored vehicles or 17 different types of agendas. This is not necessary. We need to cooperate more. We need uh, to um, uh, facilitate cooperation between the defense industries. I recently spoke about this with my Bundestag colleague. I also want to speak about our intelligence capability and about uh, cyber security. It is not always possible. It is not always possible uh, to, uh, to do everything uh, we want to, but uh, still we need to be able to protect our airplanes in the uh, Middle East uh, as they are conducting operations. Schengen area is important, but uh, we uh, need to strengthen this uh, common area. Also, we need uh, to make sure that Europeans will be able to cooperate with our British colleagues in the future. A few weeks ago, we had one of uh, such operations. We must be a stronger partner. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Larcher. Coffee break. Hope to see you at 11.30. And you can still register for the debate. 11.30, thank you.